Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to the designer John Saladino, who once studied painting at Yale University, so it's not surprising that he describes his interiors as walk-in paintings. I wonder if you can tell us, John, what that unusual and fascinating description really means. What do the two have in common? Well, I don't regard interior design as an applied art, but as a fine art. And in that respect, we really do look upon the interior as participating in art. It's art that you sit in rather than art that you look at. Well, how do you make a still life livable? Where is the place that is for human activity? Well, that's my problem. That's my tightrope walk. Uh, what I do is I concern myself with the abstraction of the space and making it beautiful. And it goes without saying, of course, that the necessity of making comfortable chairs and good reading lights are all uh, part of the project. But I don't address myself to that immediately. I address myself to the abstraction of the space. Well, apparently you were a very good painter, and then suddenly along about 1965, you decided to give up that career. What gave you the idea to be an interior designer, and how did you go about it? Well, you have to understand, first of all, uh, it wasn't that much fun being a painter. I was lonely. I wasn't married. And living in New York City, which is a technological society, everyone would go off to work in the morning but me. So that really contributed largely to my extent to get out and to participate with other people. How I went about it was simply what the New York Times always says. I read the one ads and I went around until I found a position that I thought would be good for me and, and I took it. And where was that? It's a firm that's no longer in existence. I'm sure I contributed to it, but at any rate, <laughs> uh, it was a small firm. And, and what did you do for them? Oh, everything. I did uh, presentation boards and I ran around uh, the corner uh, to pick up samples. I designed the interiors. So it was a small office. In that respect, it was good for me because I was able to learn everything from the ground up. Was there anything in your own training as a painter that has influenced your design work? I'm thinking, I guess, especially of what would most markedly characterize your work, and that is its sense of comp composition and its nuanced color. Well, I'm flattered that you would think so. I feel strongly that what I learned as a painter certainly contributed to the way I approach the designing of a space in that Can you respect. be specific? Well, the color absolutely is important. Uh, I don't think you can ever put too much effort into orchestrating the color. Uh, if you're doing an environment, you have to concern yourself not only with the color you choose, but the implication of the color as it changes through daylight, uh, through nighttime with incandescent light. Also, the quantities. You know, I often tell clients, if you put a red rug in a white room, you end up with pink walls because the light that bounces off the red flooring changes the color. So you have to know that when you're designing, all of these things, in a way, it's sort of, you have to do it circuitously. I think what you have to do, though, is to use color that's appropriate with a given situation. Uh, there are clients who want more color. There are clients who are living or have offices in the sunny parts of the world, and they, f they do, in fact, enjoy more color. Uh, I do think that you can use less color in a northern situation, such as New York City. Um, serenity has a lot to do with color, but it also has a lot to do with not over-designing, with holding back, with leaving those empty spaces. I think that's one of the things that you have been known to say, that it's what you take out of a room rather than when you, what you put into it that's most important. How do you strike that balance between the positive and the negative? Well, I tell the clients that it is very important that we concern ourselves with what we leave out and not just what we put in. A room is not just a receptacle that you stuff with furnishings or with people. There has, it's like a marriage. There has to be the seeking of an equilibrium between what goes into the space and the container itself. But there must be some guidelines that you use. Well, one of the things I do is I banish uh, lamps as most people use them, those ugly ceramic things with big shades on them. I get rid of those because those in interrupt the space. They make the room look smaller than it really is. 
And I think that they really intrude upon the serenity of the space. So that's one of the things I do. I also lower the scale sometimes of the furnishings. If you're dealing with an eight-foot high ceiling room, which I refer to as the walk-in filing cabinet for the living, <laughs> uh, you have to do a lot to give people the sense that the room is actually elegant and tall. You have to have three kinds of lighting in a room. You have to have ambient light, which is the indirect light that lights, illumines the architecture. Mm -hmm. Then you have to have the light that you read by or work by. And then you have art light. That can be anything that is specific, like lighting up a stair or a painting or candles on a table. Let's come back for a moment to the question of color. I wonder if you can tell us what color means to you and in the whole range of color psychology, obviously there are studies that reveal a great deal. Pale blue being restful, red, I guess. Uh, Energizes. It, what about green? I've often thought that, that was the color. A certain kind of green was the color that was used most often to create uh, a sense of integrated wholeness. Well, of course, no two people see the color the same way, but in my mind, a soft gray green for me is extremely restful. I mean, there are greens and there are greens, and it's also in the juxtaposition of color. Albers once uh, taught a course at Yale in which he specifically pointed out that uh, Coca-Cola does two color red tops. There's a cool red in the south and a warm red in the north. He further asked that all the students bring a two by two inch square of the most intense red that they could find. And when 30 young people put two by two inch squares together, some appeared pink, some appeared brown. Were there any particular experiences you had with him that have influenced your life or your career? I think he taught me a lot about discipline, about the fact that uh, you sometimes have to use the finest of strainers. And by that, I mean you have to be very particular so a lot of what we do is editorial. I mean, we sift out hundreds of samples that come in to the office every week. Uh, we eliminate, we examine all the things that other people don't even think about, mm -hmm. you know. Where is the light switch, and what does the light switch look like? And how high off the floor is that located? And should it be the color of the wall? So I do say that God is in the details. Would it be safe to assume that you regularly involve artists in collaborating with you and some of the interiors that you design? No, because I think we think of the interior as art. Uh, if I may be so egotistical, I am the artist. So it would be a little foolish of me to go out and seek my competition. Uh, we regard the interior literally as art. I don't care about the chair in terms of its chairness. I'm concerned with it as an abstract shape. Well, what these are two very beautiful John Saladino design chairs. What was the genesis of this chair? How did you ever get an idea to design a chair that sits so very comfortably? I hope I look as comfortable as I feel sitting in it. When did you uh, design this chair and under what well, this circumstances? This chair was designed about three years ago and I was frustrated because I wanted an absolutely anonymous chair. A, a absolutely abstract silhouette and I wanted to get rid of legs and one of the things I don't like in dining rooms are a lot of legs. I thought you banished them from dining rooms. Well I pretty much have. I hate them because if you put eight chairs around a dining table and you multiply that four times eight is 32 legs. Are they upholstered in this same uh, fashion when they are dining chairs? Sometimes yes. I've done this plush. I've also done leather. And uh, if you do leather with an aniline finish, it's incredibly practical because you can spill wine on an aniline finish leather and wipe it right off. They're childproof almost. Can I go back for a moment to what you said earlier about your interiors themselves being a work of art? Can I then conclude that there is little room in your interiors for uh, paintings and sculpture? Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, there are times when I don't feel that the wall has to be thought of as passive, that we must hang a painting on it. There are clients we've had who are great collectors, and the entire environment has been built around their collection. I, I don't cringe or run from art. It just There are times when you do the positive, and sometimes you do the negative. What if that client was also a collector of fine, or at least good, antique furniture? 
must they junk their past in order for them to have no, John no. Saladino as a designer? I think I've been typecast. I like quality. I don't care whether they're new or old as long as they're quality. And how do you define quality? I think it has to do with the integrity of form, uh, the use of beautiful materials, and the refinement of the finishing and the engineering of those materials. <coughs> You've brought with you something, some things from your own collection, these beautiful Korean bowls. Perhaps you would tell us how that collection of bowls would fit in with, I guess, what has often been described as the sensuous modernism of your own designs. Well, I regard the, the bowls, frankly, as sensual. They're corroded. The shapes are classic. What's the date of them? Oh, I would say these were probably in existence about the time that Christ walked the earth. They're archaeological. Uh, I like these not only because of their simple shapes, but also because of the corrosion and the patina that's occurred from being buried hundreds of years in a tomb. So my feeling about these is that because they are corroded, they are even more sensual. And I like the juxtaposition of them against a modern surface such as this table. Mm -hmm. We talked about some clients that are collectors. What's the ideal client for you? Well, let's see. Uh, I used to say that a client that was involved was the ideal client. Now I like the clients that leave me alone. <laughs> are there any? Are there any clients that leave me alone? Yes, yes we have a wonderful client right now that, lives, <laughs> that lives in Rio de Janeiro. So there's long distance calls. Uh, occasionally. It's the change of hours, that's why they leave you <laughs> alone. I never thought of that, you're probably right. But What's it no, like for a day in the uh, office of John Saladino and his associates? It's like Hialeah. The gun goes off and the telephones start ringing and all the lines light up. We have tried to bring efficiency experts, but they've had nervous breakdowns. <laughs> you said that the most important requirement mm. of a design is that it is appropriate for the client. That's right. So how do you arrange for that to come about? How do you get inside the client's head and try to determine what their needs are when often they may not know themselves? Well, they know a lot about what their comfort is, and that will often bring them to the point of discussing a lot of things, so to speak, through the back door. We ask the clients for two lists, one-headed must and one-headed maybe. And that will tell us, are they allergic to wool? Do they want dining for eight people? How many people do they want to comfortably sit in the living room? Like, do I must have eight. I must have eight. Or um, I have to have good reading light. People who are past 50, want to sit differently than people who are under 25. What's the difference? Well, they want to sit, first of all, more upright, and they don't want to have to have help to get in and out of the sofa. Young people don't often even like furniture. They often prefer, in fact, to lounge around on the floor. So you have to do what's appropriate to the age level as well as to the climate. Why do clients come to you? I think that they are familiar with the work. They want an environment that's beautifully designed and well engineered. And I think it's a little bit like going to a good restaurant. They know that they will dine well. Is it a confirmation of their taste? In many instances, it is. And in some cases, I think that we're status symbols. How does it feel to be a status symbol? Well. It's not uncomfortable. How many clients does your office take on at any one time? And are you involved in at least the major aspects of every job that you do? Absolutely. We, we have right now about 24 clients in the office. And I personally design every environment, whether it's corporate or residential, that goes out of the office. When we talk about one of your trademarks, and I'm thinking of the quilted bedroll, how did you develop that idea? Well, when I was poor and living in a loft, I had purchased a quilt from a department store, and I was trying to make it work on a single bed. So I simply rolled it up at the end, sort of like a cowboy's sleeping blanket, and that is where it first started. And then I decided, well, why, why not? So sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. Considering the limitations on your time and the amount of jobs that any one designer can do, obviously you have to restrict the number of clients you take. 
On what basis do you decide what kind of jobs you accept or reject? And what's the minimum amount that a job can cost? Well, the minimum job uh, that the office now takes is $100,000. Uh, in terms of the kind of clients and how you take them, that's not always easy. Sometimes you'd like to take everybody, but you can't. And sometimes you have to use your instincts. If a client, for instance, says, I know what I like, but I don't have the time to do it, that isn't a very nice thing to say, because in a way they're saying to you, look, dummy, you just get what I tell you to get. And so that is the first thing that kind of puts me off. But tell me, what do you get for $100,000? Of the $100,000, maybe 65,000 would go towards construction and the remaining monies would go towards furnishings. So obviously the priority for you is redefining the space. Oh, absolutely, because m most modern buildings, which I refer to as white glazed brick scourges on the landscape, are really not fit for human occupation. Uh, these are designed by default by realtors and they don't make any, not even the slightest gesture towards making people comfortable. So what we have to do is to restructure. That includes all the lighting. Uh, most apartment buildings, for instance, the windows are so ugly that even high positioned as they are, you can only get the view of New York City if you're standing at the window. So we often find ourselves having to put in all new windows or building some sort of a platform that would allow people to have the view when they see, uh, are seated. So you can see what goes into the construction. The doors are ugly. We always try to put in full height doors because it makes a, a space much larger in feeling and it's more elegant. What if a young John Saladino came to you today? I don't mean as a designer, I mean that young person who was living in a loft but has more taste than funds and he he or they, this young couple, come to you and say, we know your work, we admire it, and we'd like to live in an environment that you've created. What would you do for them? Or could you do something for well, them? Well, I would recommend some people that once were part of the office, and I would send them there. The truth is the overhead now of running the office is such that we cannot honestly afford to take jobs for less than the, the budget we just discussed. Well, let's complicate the circumstance. What if that young couple was either a niece or a nephew? Oh, that for sure I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you never work with your friends or relatives. Well, uh, one of the jobs that you've done that has recently appeared on the cover, in fact, of Architectural Digest is a beautiful east side of New York apartment. And you've described the living room in that apartment is a white cathedral. Can you tell us what your intent was there? What did you mean to create and do well, you think you've succeeded? The white cathedral is one half of what my concern is. My concern basically is that there be in every environment the opportunity to satisfy every emotion. So I also talk about the womb and the white cathedral. The womb is the space that you go to on cold afternoons when you want to curl up and feel protected from nature. The white cathedral is where you go on a beautiful May morning when you wish you really weren't indoors. That's where you go to be as close as you can to being not sheltered. So I always feel that these two things are very important if we can accomplish that in the environment. Tell us what kind of environment you created there? Well, the there. east side apartment was a little different than a lot of our work because uh, architecturally it was already beautiful. Our role there was not to tear down, but to hold back. And in that respect, we did what we thought was a minimalist attitude. What's the most difficult part of your work these days? Is it cajoling the suppliers, arguing with the upholsterers, persuading the client? Uh, well, there's two real problems that always occur. It usually has to do with the collapse of the client's trust in us. That usually happens about How three, far into the job? Three months. Three months <laughs> After in. the first bills come. <laughs> no, the bills don't do it. It's a little bit like being caught in traffic. They think that if they jump into a cab, somehow the cab will lift and fly over all the traffic. <laughs> but it doesn't happen. And when 
the job is in progress, they get discouraged because they think it's going to go much quicker than it does, and it doesn't. And we warn them constantly that everything will be dirty in the apartment except the inside of the refrigerator. But they don't remember that until they have to come home after a long day of hard work and walk into an apartment that's covered with dirt and dust. So that's when it begins to collapse. And at which point does it pick up again? About a month before moving. So you have about four months <laughs> of a lot of hand-holding. And what is the average duration of a job then? Eight months. More and more interior designers are trying to devise strategies to mass market themselves and their products. Do you see this as a trend and does it interest you? Well, in terms of uh, making good design available to the public, I would say yes, because obviously I'm doing that. My feeling would be that good design should be available to the American public. If you go into a department store in Italy, you can find the best design. In the United States, we can't do that. So wasn't there a John Saladino collection for Bloomingdale's where, in fact, I thought you said that you were offering Maseratis at Buick prices, That's right. as I recall? That's right. Well, what's the fundamental difference between a Maserati and a Buick in terms of construction or fabric or scale or price? Well, the difference is in the engineering and in the finishing. The, uh, the furniture at Bloomingdale's was not five coats of hand-rubbed high-gloss lacquer, nor was it Carpathian elm burl. It was covered, it was laminated in formica. So that's how we were able to maintain the design and to take some of the cost out of the furniture and make it. You've said that there is such a thing as vulgar scale. What does that mean? Vulgar scale? Overdone, um, exaggerated, um, sofas that become grotesque, uh, the kind of things that you see from time to time, nine foot long sofas, lamps that are six feet high, um, chairs that would take four men to move one of them. That's what I mean by vulgar scale. How do you live at home? You have several small children. No, 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 I have one. one. We, we have one son, Graham. Um, we live pretty much the way people don't expect us to live. Um, that means like all the rest of us. I suppose so. What's uh, it like? Well, we bought an apartment, a beautiful apartment, five years ago that I kept saying I was going to remodel in the summer when my wife and son go to the country. That was five years ago. You started to say something about Graham's room. His room is ghastly. Uh, it's Has a, he designed it? It's, well, it's called Design by Default. Um, it happened. He moves the furniture around quite often and he has ugly little decals all over the walls and over uh, the bathroom door and trophies everywhere, pictures of school, classmates. It's a very human environment. And can you restrain yourself from intruding upon it? I did commit mental suicide about four years ago, so I don't even see it when I walk into the room. I How just, does he feel about the rest of the house? About the rest of the house? Mm -hmm. He's very non-intimidated by any part of our environment. He uses it at will. He often will run across the living room, and we have a leather pair of uh, leather mattresses that are stacked. And he will run right across the leather mattresses if I'm not in the room. Is that what you had in mind for that environment? The leather mattresses? No, his uh, Running the availability across? to him. No, I did not have that in mind. I have found that... Uh, Leather is the panacea for families with young children and slip covers. So your apartment is a living laboratory. Well, it, it really isn't a laboratory. It's just a mess. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's the case, and I know that you are sacrificing accuracy for humor in general, can one say that a Saladino environment produces a psychological effect? Within uh, bounds, it sounds to me rather desirable that your son is not intimidated by your occupation. Oh, I've, I've discussed that with my wife. I said, I wondered if he would be so normal <laughs> if we had done this apartment as I wanted to do. I do think, though, that... that What's your conclusion there? I frankly think he's such a strong personality that no matter what we do to the apartment, he would still be the same person. Perhaps environment doesn't affect us as much as we think it does. Oh, it does. It does. If I may say so, the, the, it's a little bit like clothing. You know if you're well-dressed, if you're wearing a tuxedo or an evening gown, 
you act more proper than if you're in jeans. And I think an environment is somewhat that way too. A, a room that's beautifully furnished and appointed tends to quiet down the movements of people. It doesn't intimidate children because children don't know what things cost and they don't understand all the work that goes into it. We have an extremely rare oriental carpet and my son runs across that carpet as though it were a sisal carpet. Well, so much of your design relies on a modernist tradition. In the light of what you say now, do you think that people such as Gropius and Mies would think of you as an inheritor or a violator of those traditions? Well, see, I walk a tightrope because my interiors, the shell, the architecture, is very modern. But how I furnish it depends upon often the client, too. If I choose to bring in period chairs and an antique carpet, I'm sure that Gropius would have said I was a violator. Mies would not. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two people who are both considered great modernists in his own apartment, Mies van der Rohe had period furniture. He had a 18th century Irish hunt table. How do you describe yourself as an interior designer, an interior decorator, a space planner, an artist, or all of the above? Well, you know, right now even we're doing architecture. So I don't put a label on, I just say we do everything. In any case, John Saladino, for being practical, philosophical, and even poetic with us today, very special thanks for being with us. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom.